David Poydrin. I'm sales director at Crisp Malt, and uh, I have Mike Benson with me. And Mike, you are? I'm Mike Benson, as Steve just said, and I look after the West of England and Wales for Crisp. So, Crisp, uh, for those of you who don't know, and shame on you if you don't know, and shame on us for not letting you know in advance, um, Crisp are a malting company of 150 years um, repute. Um, We were supposed to be having big celebrations this year uh, for our 150th. Uh, They've been delayed. Hopefully, there's going to be some wonderful 151st birthday celebrations next year when we're we're eventually allowed back out again. Um, So, we have... uh, Seven maltings in our group, three in East Anglia, including um, North Norfolk, uh, Great Bribra, uh, which has one of the three remaining floor maltings in England. Um, we have two in Scotland, primarily supplying the, the whiskey industry up there. Uh, one in Hamburg, supplying uh, domestic and, uh, and export malt out of Germany. And then one in Poland, uh, supplying primarily the, uh, the domestic Polish market. Um, so that's a, a very brief bit about us. Um, I'm uh, more of a monster, um, and Mike is more of a brewer. So I think Mike is going to drop out now and yep. come back and, and do the second half. I'm just going to do a brief um, talk about uh, the crop this year, um, the growing season, and what quality it looks like we're going to get. And then Mike's going to come back and talk to you about what he thinks we ought to do about it. Super. See you in five mm. minutes. Yes. Five minutes. <clears throat> So hopefully uh, we can present, and if I do that, then hopefully all is good and you can see the title slide. Um, And there's a few thumbs up coming, which is all good. So if we move on, hopefully. So we've done the introduction. So the Grand System Review. So very quickly, um, for those of you who don't know or need a refresher, um, just looking at winter barley, growing cycle of winter barley, just to give you some idea of the timelines and what's important and what isn't important. So winter barley, planting now, probably ideal sowing time is just about now. Um, And then the crop grows, obviously, through it will pause through the winter time, then take off again in April, May um, and maturing in July. If we were growing spring barley, the spring barley would be planted typically in uh, in April. But, so ideal time is probably mid-March. Um, so sowing time is generally mid-Feb to mid-April time. Um, and then it matures. So you just concertina this flow up, this diagram up, and you would see uh, maturity around um, in August. <clears throat> so just having a look at the weather. So just introduce a few weather graphs because um, it has been an interesting year, um, uh, not only with COVID, but also with the weather. So these weather graphs are from the Met Office, um, and they are showing the the variance to the average, the 30-year average, so 1981 to 2010 average. This is rainfall, so anything blue is wetter than average. Uh, the darkest blue is over 170% of the average, and anything brown, which is pretty rare on this um, this screen, is uh, is drier than average. So you can see that in the autumn time, so this is autumn, Meteorological autumn is September, October, November. Um, we had wet weather. Um, people can probably remember it. York was particularly wet, Yorkshire. Um, but the impact on the planting season was reduced plantings of winter cereals, particularly wheat, which goes in a bit later than barley. But we saw reduced plantings. So we know that we were going to have a smaller crop uh, of, of winter barley. <clears throat> if we move on to uh, to through the winter was wet as well. And then through into February, um, I've never seen a map bluer than this. Um, it is pretty, pretty blue. Um, so very, very wet February. We'll all remember this as well. Um, everyone was underwater. And so the crop sat in water for a long time. Didn't do the winter barley a lot of good, but it also delayed the spring barley planting. Then we moved into spring and suddenly it turned dry. So spring barley went in late. Winter barley then had time to suck up all the moisture that was still left, started growing nicely. But then we hit this this dry period, bearing in mind this is spring, um, which is meteorological spring is uh, March, April, May. Um, So March was still wet. May was extremely dry, extremely hot, extremely sunny. So everything started getting under stress. And then 
moving into summertime when we want the nice dry weather the rainfall came the rainfall came late it saved some of the crops just about um the crops did ripen despite lack of sunshine so this is now a variance to sunshine with the gray being less than average so summer was not was not overly sunny was not overly dry um so what we've seen in the end is a crop that has probably failed to meet all our expectations um despite there being uh on paper plenty of it so just moving quickly swiftly on to the the crux of it then so this is what we've got um so far this is a this is a survey um done by the ahdb used to be the hgca um agricultural and horticultural development board and so these are just average numbers on the harvest data so far so it's provisional numbers so what this is telling us is that if you're looking at roughly the same amount of samples of winter and spring at the moment um the winter and spring crops are quite similar they're quite heavy uh, we'll have a look at a comparison in a minute with last year. They're both higher nitrogen than we would really want. Bearing in mind, this is all barley, including feed barley. Um, low screening, so not many thin corns and a high uh, number, uh, a, a high uh, percentage of, of big corns. So those retained on a two and a half millimeter screen. So greater than two and a half millimeter diameter. We're up at 95% an hour our intake standard is is 85% plus. So you can see it's big and bold. Probably more interesting is looking at the comparison between years here. So 2019 and 2020. Um, so you can see in terms of, uh, I talked about the specific weight. So that is kilograms per hectolitre. That's basically how much you can get in a bucket. If you fill a bucket up, how much does it weigh? This year, it's heavier, quite considerably heavier. Um, so you get more in your truck, um, you'll get more, potentially more in your mash tun. It won't sit quite so high up in the mash tun if you're putting the same amount in. Um, you can see the nitrogen content is way up. Um, so we're seeing a, a big increase in the nitrogen content. Um, and also the screenings, the, the retained over two and a half, the screenings levels are down, the corns are bigger. So we've got a big, bold, heavy crop, um, which is higher nitrogen than last year i've also left the standard deviation uh numbers in here um i've learned a little something it was all just statistics to me um before before now and uh, my idea of what a standard deviant would apparently what wasn't anything to do with statistics um but uh so the standard deviation i've learned is that um one standard deviation either side of the average would um contain 67 percent of all the intake so 67% of all the barley that we've taken in so far has been within plus or minus 0.2 of 1.83 of the, sorry, of this, of this sample. So the interesting thing about the standard deviation on here is that they're all similar. So it's not, it's telling us that we've got the same sort of distribution of nitrogen, of grain size, of a specific weight, but uh, we haven't, we, we, all we've done is moved the whole lot up and down. So it's not like it's a flat curve. We haven't got range, a huge range from end to end. We've got much the same um, sort of distribution as we had last year. So that's the sort of crop that we're looking at. Um, we're still going through our, we've got our intake samples, our intakes coming in. We're still working out what we've got. I can't vouch for what um, all the other maltsters have got. And uh, I, I know that some of you um, shamefully probably don't use Chris malt. So we are keeping this sort of a general, general advice. Um, I will be back at the end, I guess, if we have time to answer some questions. But I shall uh, now disappear and hand you over to Mike, who's going to talk about the uh, the brewing implications. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, glad to be back. I've just seen. Well, enjoying. Uh, what Steve's had to say. Um, so do keep them coming. Um, so I will go through now um, what it actually means for um, you guys brewing within the brewery. Um, so if everything works well. 
which I'm going to turn my cam. Oh, there we go. It's come on. So Steve explained everything that's gone on within the fields. Um, and this is basically what we take from the stats that he just gave you of, of what it's going to mean for you guys. So we'll start with the corn size. So actually how big the barley is. Um, now, basically, that's just 100% dictated by the variety in the weather. Um, so the grain being the, the water coming at the wrong time, sunshine going at the wrong wrong time affects that. Now, when we bring the, the, the barley into the maltins, it goes through a 2.25 mil screen. So basically everything below 2.25 mil is taken out and then it passes through a 2.5 mil screen. And this is how we can figure out how even the grains are. So from 2019, where it was 93.4% uh, being retained by 2.5 mil, this year we're at 95.3. So the large, you're, you're after anything above 90% of this, but us being uh, a little bit higher this year, not us in general, um, us, the, the general barley crop being higher this year is, is actually quite good. Um, so there's the potential to get more extracts from bigger corn sizes, but it's not necessarily always the case. Um, but the main thing is it being so high at 95%, it means it's quite an even grain size. Now, uneven grain size is really, really bad because it can have um, effects as it's coming through the malting. So you get different uptakes of, of, of water during steeping, which is going to give un, uneven germination. And then that's going to affect everything from the milling uh, through to the brew house issues. So the good news is we've got decent grain sizes. I'm going to turn my video off because my uh, Wi-Fi is struggling a little bit. Um, the next thing is nitrogen. So nitrogen is basically a measure of protein within the grain. Um, pretty much all the, the protein is there as nitrogen. So we measure it as nitrogen. And if you want to convert to protein, you quite literally just times it by 6.25%. Um, now, higher nitrogen content can give these steely grains that, again, are difficult to hydrate. So you've got high nitrogen grains and you've got uh, uneven grain size, then you can get really, really big issues coming through. It can affect extract as well, but we'll come back to that. But the biggest th problems that we're going to see through the, the nitrogen being higher this year is basically around hazes with especially being um, cask hazes. So the main things to look at is optimizing your boil, your boil pHs to make sure you get maximum protein coagulation during the boil. And also optimizing your kettle finings and your auxiliary finings. Now you can buy kits for these from Murphy's and Sun. Um, or and, and do it yourself, or you can ask Murphy's to come in. We can can help out. Um, <clears throat> but we could have spent a little bit more time going through. Um, do optimize uh, the kettle finings, but Murphy's are.